Troy, you were, you were, you were <laughs> abruptly cut. I was, yeah. yes, I know, but all good, all good for a great cause. Um, so I think what I really wanted to say was that I became independent very, very early because of obviously the status of my family. Um, and football was the thing that drove me, despite disappointment, I didn't make it as well like Keith, but football was the thing that drove me on. It made me a leader, it made me competitive, um, mm. and it made me also challenge. And I think those are some of the values that I've carried on throughout my kind of life. Um, coming into the organisation I work for, Kick It Out, I've been here 12 years now, um, having been a, a teacher, um, a, a tutor, a, a, a support system, a coach, a, an advocate, all those things that we continue as the values of our life. Um, and what Kick It Out has taught me is that football is not fair. Yeah. Um, it's quite unjust. Um, as, as life. As life, yeah, mm. but it's taught me that in a different way. When all I thought about for football was three points, was values, was making sure that my, the people in my care, you know, I didn't just see them as footballers, I saw them as young players and I saw them, me as a father figure, to help them develop in life. And then the challenges of the game have really come in the last 12 years. I have to re remain grateful because I travel up and down the country and educate young people, inspire young people to be the next Troy Townsend almost, yeah. um, because I won't last forever. Um, but it's a, it's a role that I take on uh, massively and it's very important to me. You know, the words that I use that can be repeated by others. I've seen young players now grow up and be the leaders in this conversation and they're playing for the England national team or they're playing, you know, first team football. So for me, I've kind of done a job but I'm not ready to leave yet. I'm not ready to go. There's more young people to inspire. And I suppose today is, is all about that. Amazing. Um, um, Keith, I mean, we touched a little bit about uh, the Street Soccer Foundation. Uh, can you elaborate about what is it and the items and objectives of the foundation? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, so ultimately, the, the Street Soccer Foundation is a sport for change charity. Um, and I formed the charity back in 2015. Um, purely and simply, it was based on me learning about homelessness statistics. Okay. Um, so I, I was, um, I guess, blinded to the social issue. Um, and having heard about it and learned about the statistics around that, I wanted to do something about it. Um, and so that, that's, that's really important to me to share that with you in terms of you know, you might think things, but then whether you do something about it or not is all is, is what it actually matters. Yeah. And so when I learned about it, I was impelled not just to actually offer a donation to, you know, a homeless charity, for example. But I know, as I think we all do on this panel, certainly that the true power of football as the global number one sport, how yeah. it unites people from all different colours, backgrounds, creeds, cultures um, across the world. And so Fundamentally, I wanted it to be set up as a partnership-led organisation, and it's exactly what we're about. So we operate nationwide across England, working with community arms of professional football clubs, predominantly in the Premier League, um, but we are now sort of disseminating that across the, the English Football League as well, and working with grassroots at a level as, uh, uh, in addition to that. Um, and fundamentally, you know, what we've got as a mission statement now is that we recently formed a partnership with the Commonwealth, um, which gives us an incredible opportunity on a global platform to inspire, educate and empower young lives. And the collective audience of that is over one billion young people. Wow. So our mission ultimately is to, to kind of champion how football can be used as a force for good and inspire young people and the next generation to utilise the sport and the power of the sport to empower other people and embrace their communities, learn for themselves, educate themselves um, and be the best version of themselves to then affect positive social change around them. I mean, I have so many questions in my head while you speak about, <laughs> uh, you know, because we have seen lots of footballers actually making very, very high profile footballers, making social and very public statements about things that are, are going, I think, more than before even. But we're going to touch about that. First, I want to hear from Troy about uh, uh, Kick It Out and AIM's objectives and what, what can we learn about it? Yeah, so first of all, let me give you an insight. They're uh, Eng English football's um, anti-discrimination charity. So we were formed in 1993, so this year we'll be recognising 30 years in August. Oh, wow. And I say recognising rather than celebrating, because who wants to celebrate 30 years of ch tackling and fighting yeah. racism and discrimination? Yeah. And I have to be grateful at this moment to our former chair, Lord Herman Oosley, who was chair of the organisation for 26 years, um, for his foresight and his belief and understanding that we could make a change in this game. 
So because of the abuse that our black figures used to get back in the 80s and the 70s and him being a supporter, um, people used to come to him in his position and say, we need the rights of black people prominent in black players, prominent in, in our game. And so we started Let's Kick Racism Out of Football at first as we focused on just racism. Um, you know, if I mention the likes of John Barnes, you know, mm. Cyril Regis, Laurie Cunningham, those figures are figures that, that stood above high despite the discrimination and racism that they faced. And then we changed in 1997 to the name that we have now, Kick It Out. Yeah. Um, and we changed because the work that we were doing in regards to supporting those players, providing them with a platform, providing them with a voice um, to which that voice was coming through us. Um, was then to change our name to Kick It Out, to take on other forms of, of discrimination. So whether it be anti-Semitism, whether it be homophobia, whether it be mm. sexism, we were actually now growing as an organisation, not in numbers of employees, but definitely growing with the importance of our voice. And as we've gone through the years, many people, particularly in the 90s, when the Premier League was was formed, obviously, which was a year before we became prominent, and many people thought that racism didn't exist. And actually the, the, the product on the field of play, which was now becoming this big, massive billion dollar business, was the thing that needed to be promoted more than the experiences of our black players. Um, and so our voice became a little weakened because everyone was focused on the product on the field of play and the fact that the, the global rights to the game now was being sold right across the world. Um, but those players were still coming to us wanting support and wanting guidance. And, and that has remained the theme uh, for the 30 years. You know, the, the goal is to eradicate racism and discrimination out of the beautiful game. Um, whether that will ever happen is another matter. But also, as, as you've kind of touched on there, it's also provide a platform because the players now, and I'm not even sure that they're well aware of this, have a massive status, mm. not just in football, but in society as well. Mm -hmm. And their acts, the things that they do um, as role models are enabling the future to realise that they can actually step up on that platform and challenge and promote and kind of seek guidance from. Um, and for me, it's an amazing thing to, to hear, to see, to witness. But also then the other side of it is those players then get criticised for not focusing on their game. You know, if they're not scored a goal that weekend, well, it's because you, you went out and you tried to feed children. As we know that Marcus Rashford got yes. criticised quite a bit. But we look yeah. at Marcus Rashford and he's headstrong and actually his game has now gone on to another level. There, so there's many, many examples, but Marcus Rashford being the person that he is, is probably the best one to mention. True. So to be able to, to, to provide that platform for players to realise their kind of prominence in the game, and I still think, if you don't mind me saying, and I'm just going to close with this, that our players are not sure of some of that, where that identity is. If we look at our US sports stars, our US sports figures, they are ready to stand up at any stage. They will stop uh, a game, a sport, because they believe that the, you know, they're being challenged. They're very right to be on the field or the court is being challenged. I think for me, that's the next stage of probably where our, our professional footballers go in this country, realising the value of their voice, the importance of their voice. We've just seen that in England with all the fallout behind the BBC. And I'm not really a politician, but Gary Lineker was supported by many, many other figures. And sometimes I think that if that same thing happened as our players are being racially abused, then maybe we would have stopped uh, the racial discrimination from quite a long time ago. Well, we nearly saw it at the World Cup as well. Nearly. nearly. It was nearly, nearly there. <laughs> but Holly, I mean, listen to Keith and Troy. Do you think sports in general and football uh, in particular is equal and, and um, inclusive and not discriminating? I want to be positive, but I'm also um, very real on this subject. And I think for now, no. I think there's still so many issues within the game and just, you know, the other day with Patrick Vieira being sacked, I think now that's, mm -hmm. he was the only black manager. Black manager yes. Um, in the WSL, uh, we struggle with managers from black backgrounds and minority ethnic backgrounds. And I think 
when you're looking at you know um, the stats and the data that suggest that there are people out there from minority ethnic backgrounds who do have their coaching badges who are um, working their way up the ladder but there's it's almost you know a, a concrete ceiling where they can't get any higher they can't get any further because unfortunately we do have systemic barriers in the way within football whether that's men's football when women's football and i speak specifically um of this country and i think in order for change to really occur we have to start seeing more action from the top and we need less lip service i'm personally not a fan of you know wearing t-shirts that says you know no to racism because for me it's a tick box exercise um having quotas are again a tick box exercise that are just dealing with matters on a surface level we're not really looking at the deeper um issue that we have here around racism and why certain people are struggling to have opportunities or why there are barriers for them um and it, for me i think it all comes down to becoming more anti-racist it's, it's it's knowing that you can't just turn up you know for black history month you can't just turn up for a picture with your t-shirt that says no to racism you have to turn up every day you have to be able to call out microaggressions you have to be able to understand that you know if you're white you do benefit from white privilege um you know white supremacy is the the overarching reason or factor behind racism and i think what we need to do as an industry is have a moment of reflection or introspection where we look at ourselves and think about how am i what am i doing within this problem am i part of the problem and i think we need to unlearn and relearn to to, to recognize where we are as a country and where we are as an industry because mm -hmm. we can't make change if we can't accept and acknowledge that you know racism is a fact you will have people question you even up to this day that you know white privilege isn't a thing or actually we're not racist as a country or you know institution institutional racism is not a thing if we're still going to be arguing about those matters how can we expect to see any change on the pitch or off the pitch because we're still arguing about something that we have been for centuries and i think you go I was just gonna say sorry i didn't mean to cut you like that but when you said arguing you know, we're arguing about the experiences of people who yeah. have been discriminated against. Yeah. Mm, I mean, true. that should never be an argument, by the way. True. You, you op you're open, you listen to those experiences and accept that change needs to happen. Mm. If I have to argue with another person on a national radio station mm. about the victimization of black people in the sport, for them to say to me, insinuate to me that I'm the racist, then we've got, no, we've got nowhere else to go. Yeah. But I'm infused by the people that are coming up in our game that we can influence, that we can speak to, that we can understand, that actually they can amplify our voices in different arenas, in different areas. So we have to hang on to that little piece of hope. Mm. But the fact that you've mentioned, argue, the fact that we argue about the experiences when yeah. the privilege doesn't allow those experiences to happen yeah. mm. is the thing that really rolls me up a little bit and shows me that actually I've got to walk the path a little bit longer to enable others to follow me on that path as yeah. well because I wouldn't, them, wouldn't want them to have the same arguments that mm. we have had for a very, very long time. Change has been incredibly slow in this area. So when we're talking about diversity and representation across the board in football, we've seen that change can occur at a fast rate if people at the top want it to. And I said this to you just before, when you know we had the issue of the European Super League, matter of days, um, <laughs> unrest, fans, uh, board members, etc. People came to a, to a halt and came together and they stopped it. Yeah. So if we want to make change, we can. It's just that people in positions of power are choosing the rate at which those changes occur. And um, unfortunately, it can be a very frustrating battle because you want to make change and you want to affect change. But um, it's almost like a, it's a constant battle day by day by day. Yeah. Whereby very, very Sisyphic. Yes. Yeah.